Uh, it's Easter Sunday. Fantastic. Um, you can argue about whether it's the, the, the greatest day in the Christian year. Uh, obviously, Christmas is in with a shout. It has its appeal. But um, I remember reading a few years ago, a leader of one of the big trade and industry groups uh, asked to uh, explain what he thought the Christmas sales figures meant for the future of his industry, replying that the true meaning of Christmas will not be clear until Easter. So I thought that was quite a <laughs> neat observation. Today we want to talk about the resurrection and that it shows us two things, the greatness of God, but also the goodness of God, and that neither of those alone would really have been that much for us, but together they really show us who he is. Um, and it's said that only two things are certain in life. Um, this is the most famous statement of that idea, but it comes up a lot. And it was written by Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the founding fathers of the United States, shortly after the, uh, the country was established as a country. And he wrote this in a letter to Jean-Baptiste Leroy. Our new constitution is now established, he wrote, and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. That's a very common phrase, isn't it? You hear people just say it, death and taxes, the only two things that are certain. However, as Google and others have demonstrated, taxes can be avoided. So... <laughs> In fact, the only thing that's certain in life is death. This is really what you wanted to hear on Easter morning, isn't it? Uh, But it's the reality. It's the truth of our lives. Every one of us, unless the world ends before this time, every one of us will die. It's the one experience that we'll all have in common. And it is an increasingly pressing problem. Uh, On the left, that very handsome young chap that you see there uh, is Daniel. Uh, And the one holding him is me back when I had uh, brown hair and plenty of it. Uh, And of course, with the passage of time, I've decayed into the the decrepit version you see on the right-hand side (laughs) of the screen. And I don't believe that's going to get any better. Uh, And what's going to happen is, I recently turned 50. Uh, Eventually, I'll turn 60 and then 70, and then I hope I make it to 80, but I will die. And so will you. Yeah. (laughs) Now, we, you know, we, we view this differently depending on, on our ages. And for some of us, uh, I suppose, it's a, honestly, you know, there are people who are approaching their later years. At the other end of the scale, my boys probably don't give this a thought from day to day, and neither should they, really, at, at their age. But, nevertheless, given enough time, they will die. Um, and we should find that, I think, rightly horrifying. Now, some... Philosophers and some religious thinkers have said, well, death is not something to fear and it's, death is only a transition. And, um, but actually, that isn't the Christian perspective at all. Here's what C.S. Lewis said about it. Christianity tells me that I must never, like the Stoics, though they were an ancient Greek group, I must never say that death does not matter. Nothing is less Christian than that. Death, which made life himself shed tears at the grave of Lazarus and shed tears of blood in Gethsemane. This is an appalling horror, a stinking indignity. You remember Thomas Brown's splendid remark, I am not so much afraid of death as ashamed of it. And the first time I read that quote, um, it's, it resonated really strongly with me and stayed with me because we have a feeling, don't we, that death feels like an unnatural thing. And people will say to us, well, death is part of life. But actually, it doesn't feel right to us, the idea that somebody can just end. Uh, This is my mum and dad. Uh, Mum's on the left. She's still going strong. Um, She'll be coming up in a couple of weeks for a celebration we're having. Uh, But on the right is my dad. We lost him nearly 20 years ago, uh, before Dan was a year old. We just got a couple of photos uh, of my dad and my first son together. I think there are two, um, because he's gone. But can I hope this makes sense to you when I say something in me is not just sad about that, but kind of doesn't buy it. I, I sort of can't make myself believe that, that a whole person and everything that a person is can just be wiped out. Uh, this is, uh, it's not just a Spitfire, this is a Mark 5C Spitfire in clipped wing configuration. Um, And the reason I know this is because my dad, uh, when I was a boy, uh, used to restore veteran aircraft. 
So every Sunday morning, uh, we lived halfway between London and Cambridge, he would drive up the M11 to Duxford Aerodrome near Cambridge, and he led the team that restored this particular plane, AR-501, flew with a Czechoslovakian squadron during the Second World War, and it had just been left and decayed into a a pile of rust, basically. And he and his team um, got all the old schematics and the old manuals, and they found ways to restore various parts, and the parts that couldn't be restored, they found ways to make replacements. And they got this thing flying 40 years after the war, uh, and actually it's still flying today. Uh, although they've, they've changed the configuration, it now has regular wingtips instead of the clipped wings. And, but still and all, you know, that's there. And for a while, uh, my dad was arguably one of the world's leading experts on the Merlin engine, which is what powers the Spitfire and various other classic aircraft. Now, does it make sense to you when I say it seems strange, hard to grasp the idea that all that knowledge that somebody had accumulated and all the experience of his life and everything else could just be gone. Do you see what I mean? Does that make sense? It doesn't feel right to us. Um, And poets through the years have felt much the same. So this is William Wordsworth. Uh, He wrote a poem uh, called, well, his title for it was just Ode, Um, but everybody calls it Intimations of Immortality which I think is a much better title. It's very evocative, isn't it? The idea that inside each of us, there's this kind of an idea that can't go away, we can't get it to go away, that there's something more than just the life we have now. That a human, a person, it is not just something that comes to an end after 80 years and is extinguished. It's something we feel in our gut. And Wordsworth, who's classified as a a Christian mystic, I think he had all sorts of weird ideas, but he he glimpsed something when he wrote things like this. In a season of calm weather, though inland far we be, our souls have sight of that immortal sea. And this poem's been actually a great encouragement to people who can cope better with poetry than I can. I I struggle to read it, but... Uh, For example, the economist and philosopher John Stuart Mill suffered from uh, long-term depression. And it was uh, through reading this poem uh, repeatedly over and over again that he was able to lift his eyes above just the world we're in now. uh, And he writes that that's what brought him out of his depression. Um, And more recently, uh, this chap is uh, Dylan Thomas, a Welsh poet. And when his father died or was dying, he wrote this poem... Um, from a, a really a position of, of anger, I think. He said, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So what was going on there? He wasn't a Christian, but he, something in him felt the wrongness and the indignity of the idea that a human life could just end and be extinguished. He was railing against that the best he understood. So I think this is a a very common feeling. It's something kind of universal. Most people, at least to some degree, share this sense that the notion of human death feels wrong. Um, But surprisingly, perhaps, most of the Old Testament doesn't share that feeling. So on the whole, what the Old Testament... It doesn't teach this, but the, the the assumption of what it says is that death is the end, and when someone dies, they're dead. So, for example, in this psalm, it says, the dead cannot sing praises to the Lord, for they have gone into the silence of the grave. Uh, And the prophet Isaiah expands on that. He says, the dead cannot praise you, they cannot raise their voices in praise. Those who go down to the grave can no longer hope in your faithfulness. Um, Or even this from uh, Ecclesiastes. Um, King Solomon wrote this. The living at least know they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, nor are they remembered. Whatever they did in their lifetime, loving, hating, envying, is all long gone. So that may be surprising. It sort of surprised me that this is the, the general feeling in the Old Testament. And yet... This is what's always fascinating in reading the Old Testament. You get these sudden glimpses, these insights that seem to come out of nowhere sometimes. They just suddenly appear. 
People see things that they had no right to see from what they knew. So here's a beautiful example uh, in the story of Job. Now, you may remember this is the oldest book in the Bible, uh, although obviously the beginning of Genesis is describing events from further into the past. The book of Job, as most people uh, understand, was written earlier than Genesis. Uh, And the story uh, is of a man who was good in every way that people could see, um, and yet he was stricken, and he lost his family, he lost his wealth, he lost his health, and his three friends, who you see on the right, turned up supposedly to comfort him. They're known as Job's comforters, but basically... Uh, They just told him all the reasons why it was probably his fault. They were not very comforting at all. So you've got 30 chapters of argument back and forth between Job and his so-called friends. And in the middle of it, really out of nowhere, it's like a shaft of light coming out of nothing. Job suddenly comes out with this. I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. It's a man who's lost everything and yet somehow sees that actually, in a sense, he hasn't lost anything. Or there's this, uh, the prophet Daniel, one of the last prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, He retells here words that were told to him by an angel. And the angel told him this, many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. But here's the really strange thing about this passage. Uh, The angel goes on to say this, But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end. It's as though the idea of living on after death, of a resurrection, is something that, that was just being held in a box. Just a secret. So... What we had then, by the time of, uh, as we approached 0 AD, um, there was uncertainty uh, among the Jewish leaders uh, about what happened, if anything, after death. And there was an ongoing argument between different groups. And that's why, a few years later, Paul was able to pull this rather clever trick. Uh, when he was on trial before the Sanhedrin, the highest religious court in Jerusalem, here's what happened. Paul realised that some members of the high council were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. So he shouted, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, as were my ancestors, and I am on trial because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. And this divided the council. The Pharisees against the Sadducees. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, or angels or spirits, and that's why they're sad, you see. (laughs) But the Pharisees believe in all of these, so there was a great uproar. So Paul here is just neatly dividing a wedge between two groups and and the people who are putting him on trial. But what this is telling us, what's relevant for our purposes, is just that even among the the highest ruling level uh, of the religious courts there, there was this big split between people who believed that there was a resurrection, a, a new life after death, and people who thought there was not. I guess based on whether they read Job or whether they read Isaiah. Although, actually, that's unfair to Isaiah because he also has a few glimpses of the resurrection. But anyway, that was the landscape. So after hundreds of years of Jewish history and all the the law and the prophets uh, and the wisdom literature had all been written and these were all established scriptures for the Jews at the time, there was this split between those who who did and didn't believe in a resurrection. And into the middle of this, into this kind of theological dispute, perhaps quite philosophical, maybe a bit abstract, maybe the sort of thing that university students would argue about over coffee late at night, into this suddenly comes a solid fact, uh, as solid as a chunk of concrete, the actual, immediate, unambiguous, unarguable, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. A concrete fact. Uh, against which all the arguments in either direction start to look a little bit silly. So you would think that would have just settled the argument once and for all. Um, 
and that the Pharisees would no longer have needed to argue with the Sadducees. But of course, uh, they had their political reasons for wanting to think that the resurrection of Christ had been faked. So let's read through the story again. We've actually heard it twice already this morning, but it's not bad to hear it a third time. This version is from Matthew's Gospel. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you were looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying, and now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and you will see him there. Remember what I've told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy, and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. But as they went... Jesus met them and greeted them, and they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Now, I don't know what side of the Pharisees against Sadducees debate these two Marys were on. I don't know whether before this they felt that there was such a thing as a resurrection or whether death was the end, but at this point, I'm pretty sure they knew which side they came down on. Let's take a moment then and look at what the resurrection wasn't before we go on to what it was. It's important to understand this. So the first thing is, it was not a backup plan. It's not as though God's plan was to send Jesus to earth, and he would live a perfect life, and people would follow his example and lead better lives, and then after 70 or 80 years he would die. That was never the idea. Jesus himself made it really clear, actually repeatedly speaking to his disciples, what was going to happen. Uh, Here's one from Matthew's Gospel again. Jesus told them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. Now, this isn't something that took Jesus by surprise. It's not as though God looked down on Good Friday and thought, oh no, Jesus has been killed. I guess I've had to bring him back to life again. This was always the plan. This was always the idea. Here's the second thing that it wasn't. Uh, There's a thing called the Lazarus Syndrome. This is a a medical phenomenon. Uh, And what it means is when somebody who has been pronounced clinically uh, clinically dead comes back to life. And it's usually after they've had a heart attack, somebody tries to restart their heart with CPR, it fails, they call it, they put someone in an ambulance or a morgue or whatever it is, 20, 30 minutes later, they wake up and they're not dead after all. And this is a thing that happens, uh, it's been noted at least 38 times in the medical literature since 1982. Um, And I kind of worry about things like this, because I fear that Christians, not quite thinking it through, will seize on this as evidence of the resurrection and say, look, it happened to this guy in Mexico or whatever it is, so why shouldn't it have happened to Jesus? But of course this isn't at all what happened to Jesus. It's not as though it's just his heart stopped and then some physical process, maybe a warming or release of pressure, whatever it is, restarted it because the electric signal started. It's nothing like that. What we are talking about here with Jesus is that he was absolutely and ambiguously dead. And that by supernatural power, God raised him from that death to life. It's very different from just surviving, which is what we're talking about with these things. So these are the Lazarus Syndrome. It's an interesting medical oddity, but it's nothing to do with the resurrection. Here's the third thing that it wasn't. It wasn't just returning to the same life that Jesus had before. So his life before the crucifixion and his life after the resurrection were different from each other. So you remember that there's all sorts of things we have um, in the small number of stories that are told after the resurrection of things like people who knew Jesus closely not recognizing him. You know, something had changed. Um, and also situations where he just seems to appear suddenly in the middle of a room, a locked room, without 
yeah, presumably teleporting or something. Um, there's something going on. Uh, and then finally, of course, the last story that's told about Jesus on earth is this one of the ascension. This is from the first chapter of Acts. After saying this, Jesus was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. By the way, you notice the angels are... uh, they're a little bit, um, they're always telling people off, sassy, that's what I'm looking for. So the Marys go to the tomb and the angel's saying, well, well, what are you doing here? It's not here, you know, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And then here we are seven weeks later, um, and again the angels are saying, well, why are you standing here staring into heaven? You know, Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So what's happening here is that the life that Jesus is living after his resurrection, is in in ways we don't fully understand, is definitely different from his life before. It wasn't just that dying and being raised was an inconvenient three-day interruption, and he carried on doing what he was doing before. It was a a fundamental change. So the resurrection body is different from the body he had before. Now again, we don't fully understand that. I don't think we're meant to. The Bible doesn't spell out the details of how it's different, but something is different. So I'm going to read you quite a long extract now, again from C.S. Lewis, um, in which he explains this better than I would be able to. So I thought there's no point saying it in my own words. I'll just use his. I heard a man say the importance of the resurrection is that it gives evidence of survival. Evidence that the human personality survives death. On that view, what happened to Christ would be what had always happened to all men, the difference being that in Christ's case we were privileged to see it happening. But this is certainly not what the earliest Christian writers thought. Something perfectly new in the history of the universe had happened. Christ had defeated death. The door which led... The door which had always been locked had for the very first time been forced open. This is something quite different from mere ghost survival. I don't mean that they disbelieved in ghost survival. On the contrary, the disciples believed in it so firmly that on more than one occasion Christ had to assure them that he was not a ghost. The point is that while believing in survival they yet regarded the resurrection as something totally different and new. The resurrection narratives are not a picture of survival after death. They record how a totally new mode of being has arisen in the universe. Something new had appeared in the universe, as new as the first coming of organic life. This man, after death, does not get divided into ghost and corpse. A new mode of being has arisen. By the way, did you notice when we were back in Job earlier, Job sees this. He's, it's pretty amazing, actually, that this guy from the very first book of the Bible sees so far forward to understand something of the nature of the resurrection because he says this, after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. Now, Job isn't just saying my body will die and go away and my spirit will live on and see God. He's saying something much more Christian than that, actually. He's saying, in my body. Now, he's just said his body's decayed. So clearly he's talking about a new body, but also a body that is his. So what he's seeing there, he's actually foretelling something very much like what we then later see in the New Testament, when Jesus' body is destroyed, but then he rises in a body that is his, but is not the same body. Now, again we will not fully understand this, not this side of of our own death anyway. But we can get a glimpse of it. We can get some grasp on what God did in Christ. So this is the greatness of God. Do you remember we started with the title, The Greatness and Goodness of God? And the greatness of God is demonstrated in this triumph over death, that when Jesus rose, 
He did not merely survive. He did not merely return to the life that he already had. He didn't just put off the inevitable. He actually conquered death. Uh, And as Paul puts it in the the famous resurrection chapter, uh, chapter 15 of the first letters of the Corinthians, he says this, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? That's the greatness of God. An incredible demonstration of the fact that death, that one enemy that we all face, that hangs over us all, that you remember I started by saying how inevitable it is, actually, God says, no, it's not inevitable. I can do something better than that. I can bring my anointed one through death, not just back to life, but into a new and better life. So the Pharisees, of course, would have known this premise, that whatever else you say about the Pharisees, they knew their Old Testament. So they would have known, for example, this verse in Isaiah. Do you remember I said earlier I was being a bit harsh on Isaiah? Uh, He actually, here's a glimpse that he had. Those who die in the Lord will live. Their bodies will rise again. Those who sleep in the earth will rise up and sing for joy. For your life-giving light will fall like dew on your people in the place of the dead. So Passages like this will be what the Pharisees knew that made them convinced that there was a resurrection. But where they made their big mistake is in understanding how that resurrection happens and how to receive it. So here, for example, is the kind of thing they would have misunderstood. Uh, This is Paul. Now he's he's on trial again, as he so often is through the book of Acts. Uh, This time, I can't remember who this is. I think it's a a Roman governor of some kind. And Paul says these words. Now we are here to bring you this good news. The promise was made to our ancestors, and God has now fulfilled it for us, their descendants, by raising Jesus. This is what the second psalm says about Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. For God had promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I will give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. Another psalm explains it more fully. You will not allow your holy one to rot in the grave. Now, Paul is talking about God working his power in the one who he sent to earth. But the Pharisees, I think, will have misunderstood this when they'd have just seized on this idea, you will not allow your holy one to rot in the grave. So they believed in a resurrection, they recognised that it was achieved by God's power, but they thought that they could earn that resurrection for themselves by being holy ones. You will not allow your holy ones to rot in the grave. It was written in the Psalms. So the goal of the Pharisees was to live holy enough lives that God would look at them and say, well, I'm not going to let this one rot in the grave, he's good enough. Which is a tragic misunderstanding, of course. So here's what Paul says. No, it's not. Here's what one of our worship songs says. And I I really like this about it. We're going to finish with this song, and it's, it's for this reason, because of these couple of lines here. In the first chorus, we have this line, this phrase, I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. Now, this is talking about what God is going to do to us, that we ourselves will not merely survive death, but conquer it because of what God will do in us. But why does it say this? Well, it actually, in the bridge, it goes back and explains why. I believe in you. I believe you rose again. So I really like that the song has both of these resurrections in it. It has the resurrection of Christ, and it also has the resurrection of all of us that follows that. It doesn't just follow it in time. It follows it by cause as well, that God raises us because Jesus was raised. To me, that's what that song is about. So uh, the, the point here is that Jesus made the way. It's not that he was an example that showed us how we could attain to the resurrection. Again, that's the mistake the Pharisees made. They looked at the life of, of one holy man and said, OK, if God raised him from the dead because he was holy, then maybe he'll raise me from the dead if I can be holy enough. But no, what actually happened is that there was never any way to attain the resurrection except through the power that Jesus gave. A letter to the Hebrews says, by his death, Jesus opened up a new and life-giving way 
through the curtain into the most holy place. So the resurrection that God offers is not something that we can ever attain by living a good life, not even by living a perfect life. Uh, Not that any of you lot can do that anyway. Or me, just to be clear. (laughs) That resurrection comes to us only because of the work that Jesus did. It's Christ himself who raised himself to life, who will also raise us to life. Uh, John's Gospel, Jesus says, It's my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. Jesus himself does it. And again, this is what the Pharisees didn't understand. They thought that they could essentially raise themselves up by their own effort and good works. But no, actually, Jesus says, I will raise up at the last day all those who believe in me. That's the promise. How does that happen? Paul writes again, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honour at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Do you get this? The same power that raised Jesus from death to life, that same power, Paul says, is at work in us. The incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. How do we get it? Paul again, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. We don't go and get it, God gives it to us. It's really simple, isn't it? Just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Uh, How does it come to us? You were buried, it's Paul again, different letter, you were buried with Christ when you were baptised, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Actually, this is all that is asked for us. And in terms of what the, the Bible has to say about how we attain to the resurrection of the dead, it says it's because you trusted. It's because you trusted. So as it so often is, you know, what it comes down to in the end is this recognition that whatever work we do, however hard we try, whatever efforts we make to live morally pure lives, to be charitable, to be kind to people. Of course, all of that is good, but none of it will ever earn God's favour. But God's favour is just there for the taking, and and, and all that's required is for us to trust him, to believe that he's as good as he says he is. And here, of course, is where we're tipping over from talking about God's greatness into God's goodness. So the promise is that what God did for Christ in raising him from the dead he will also do for us. Um, God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Uh, And that's Paul yet again, this time in the first letters to the Corinthians. And the significance of this is, do you remember if you go right back to what we were saying before, the long period of the Old Testament, when it doesn't, it's certainly not clear about there being a resurrection, all the arguments that were happening in those hundreds of years leading up to the time of Christ, nobody really knew was that feeling that we have in our gut that a human being can't just come to an end and be extinguished? Uh, was that right? Or was that just a, a pleasant illusion? Was it a story people told themselves to feel better about death? That was the question for all those hundreds of years. And the answer now comes at the end. It's demonstrated through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's given to us. Why? Because God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. And that is the goodness of God. So finally, I just want to make this point, that uh, there have been a lot of of great people in the world, powerful people, people with a lot of influence. This, of course, is Hitler. By any worldly measure of power and influence, he was a great man, but he was not a good man. And if the God that we worship was just a great God, that would be terrifying. A God with infinite power but no love, 
Uh, and here's the opposite. What if God was only good but not great? Then he would be like these anti-war protesters with their sign painted on a bed sheet. Uh, I think this was trying to stop the uh, Iraq war. Um, obviously, unsuccessfully, people with good hearts wanting to do the, the, what they saw as the right thing and yet with no power to actually influence events. And if God were like that, then that would be no use to us either, would it? But the great thing, the fantastic thing, is the God we worship is both great and good. And it's because of his goodness that we benefit from his greatness. That great power of his to raise to life, to bring new life, better life, comes to us because he is good. And that's why, and this is the last of uh, Paul's observations that I'm going to read out today. That's why he says, you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So when we celebrate the resurrection today on Easter Sunday, the resurrection actually has two meanings. First of all, of course, it means the resurrection of Christ 2,000 years ago, uh, a well-attested historical fact. But we also celebrate the resurrection that every one of us shares in if we just accept that goodness and greatness of God. I'm trying to remember that line from one of the songs we sang earlier. Uh, our worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. And as we sang that, I realized you could swap the words around. It would still be true. Worthy is the king who was slain. Now, there's nothing a lamb can do to stop itself being slain. It's only a lamb. It can't fight back. A king has power, but it was actually a king who was slain on Good Friday, as well as a lamb. And equally, worthy is the king who conquered the grave, but it was also the lamb who gave himself for us who did that. Worthy, we could sing, worthy is the lamb who conquered the grave. Our God is both a king and a lamb. He's both good and great. He's both powerful and loving. And that's the God that we worship on Easter Sunday. So I'll just pray before we hand back to the musicians. Oh, Father, thank you so much that you are both great and good. And thank you that you demonstrated that greatness so powerfully in raising Christ from the dead. And thank you that you demonstrate that goodness so extraordinarily in giving to each one of us that same promise of a resurrection, of a resurrection body that is our body, but not the same one we have now, not subject to corruption or decay, but a resurrection body that you give. Your greatness is so good. Your goodness is so great. And thank you that you are absolutely worthy of all of our worship. Amen.